Get your milk ready, boys. It's time for a spicy one. Every so often, it's fun to go and read a blog post or an article about why the Linux desktop failed. And today, we have exactly that. Desktop Linux. Desktop Linux, meaning GNU Linux and the entire ecosystem, has been suitable for non-geeks since about 2004. I think that's pretty arguable, but sure, we'll go with the date. It works well, looks good, uh, has superior security and freedom from malware, has thousands of applications covering almost every need, and costs nothing. In spite of these advantages, it has failed to win more than a 2% share of end-user desktops. Why? Here are the main reasons for low adoption by end-users in my opinion. Some of the points in here are actually somewhat reasonable. Other points, well, you'll see when we get to them. Fear or hatred of change. People hate change. Linux is easier to use than Windows. You know, I would argue against that, but sure, we'll go with it. But requires scrapping familiar habits and learning new skills for most folks, this is unacceptable. I don't think that's really the case. I don't think most people are against learning new things. They're learning new things basically all the time. What they are against is learning new skills for basically no value. And I hate to break it to you, but most people simply don't care about open source, don't care about free software, don't care about any of the stuff that Linux users typically care about. It's hard enough to get some people to care about data security or even just a good password. I think the best example of this is with the adoption of smartphones. Smartphones came into being when I was in primary school and then got popular when I was getting into high school. And smartphones are now this universal thing that everybody uses. And people started using them because they saw the value that having a computer in your pocket was going to give you. But for most people out there, Linux doesn't have that same kind of improvement. At best, Linux is a horizontal to slight upgrade if you actually care about things like security. And depending on the workflow you have, it might be a bit of a downgrade for some people. And the next point, balkanization. Many competing flavors of Linux with different user interfaces. I think we can all agree that there are Maybe a little too many distros out there. There's only a handful of desktop environments and window managers that are really talked about. Maybe, maybe 10 that are actually in popular use. And that's really pushing it. Past GNOME and KDE, things drop off really quickly. But this is sort of the nature of the open beast. There is nothing that can be done to stop this. I think what we can do is do a better job at guiding people to the things they should be paying attention to. If you're a new Linux user, it doesn't matter if you're using Xorg or Wayland. It doesn't matter what a window manager is. Just send the person to like GNOME or KDE and be done with it. Doesn't really matter the distro or Ubuntu and things like that. Just send them in a simple direction and then they can work out the rest from there. Several window managers with application compatibility issues. Now, if this said desktop environments, that would make sense. If this said Wayland compositors, this would make sense. I have no idea what is being said with window manager application compatibility. I've never seen this. I've never heard anybody talk about this. Generally, with a Tyler, sometimes applications might play a little weirdly and spawn in like either tiling or floating when they shouldn't be, but everything works. Several incompatible application packaging formats and tools, meaning all of these different package managers we have out there like apt, pacman, dnf, flatpak, snaps, app images, and all this other stuff. The benefit we have is the number isn't really growing. And as these GUI software centers tend to improve, it obfuscates what is actually going on in the background. Also, there are now tools like DistroBox, which can obfuscate that even further 
and use the tools on any system you want to be using. Then there is the package manager for vanilla OS called Apex, which basically makes a package manager style application, but uses DistroBox in the background, allowing you to install anything from anywhere. Package naming and content variants causing application dependency variants. That is such a weird way to phrase it. I think what they're trying to say is different distros name packages differently. Sometimes those packages contain different things, like you might have a distro that has a big meta package, whereas other distros splits that package into a bunch of smaller packages, and sometimes distros will have different versions of dependencies. This is actually a serious problem, and is the reason why a lot of developers like the Bottles developer only officially supports the Flatpak, same with OBS and a bunch of others. This is a singular system that works everywhere and works consistently everywhere. But most of the time when packaging is working correctly, it's not something you really have to think about. And these GUI software centers are making it easier to just ignore what's going on in the background and just grab the application you want. Library API changes causing applications to suddenly fail require revision. This can happen just as much on Windows as well, but if you're using a point release like Ubuntu or an LTS release of Ubuntu, this problem really isn't going to happen. But the problem is far more pronounced on rolling releases like uh, Arch Linux, for example. But usually when a problem like this does happen, the debug information is more openly presented to the user so you can go and work out the problem yourself rather than just being like, hey, here's a box, you can go report the issue to the developers, but it doesn't really help you right now. Application developers must be willing to support slightly incompatible versions of Linux. Build once, run anywhere is not possible. Now, a lot of application developers do go and do this, but a lot of others don't even remotely. As I said, with the Bottles developer, the flat pack is the only official way to run Bottles. If you have an issue running Bottles and you're not using the flat pack, that's not the Bottles dev issue. That's your fault for not using it the way you're supposed to be using it. And attempts at standardization have gone nowhere, which is entirely untrue. Flat pack is a very quickly growing standard and I don't see it going away. Developers of popular applications refuse to deal with Linux. I don't think this has anything to do with this previous point. The reason why outside of election applications this doesn't really happen is building an application for a whole new operating system when it's very likely you're using some sort of internal toolkit that doesn't support that OS is very expensive. And if the native Linux games have gone to show us anything, a lot of the time those projects don't really make much money. So it's a giant expenditure that you're probably going to lose money on. I see why it doesn't happen. And now we get into one that's just pure nonsense. Credibility. No major company with clear staying power is producing or supporting a desktop Linux system. Now I have a feeling this was written before the Steam Deck was possibly even announced, because Valve, I would say, is a company with clear staying power. They've been around for a long time and don't show any sign of disappearing. Then there are companies that are producing hardware that is supporting desktop Linux, like AMD, Intel, NVIDIA. Then you have companies that are selling Linux devices, like Dell, Lenovo. You have companies that are inside of the Linux space that are supporting the Linux desktop, like Red Hat, Canonical, which generate a lot of their money from the server space, which is a very big space. So they get that money there, funnel it into the desktop, improve the system, and it's better for everyone. Google makes Chromebooks using a customized Linux kernel, and some Linux applications can be used on some models if you have the necessary knowledge to install them. If you just look at a YouTube video. Google avoids using the Linux name because this is bad for marketing. Now, the reason Google avoids using the Linux name is because the Linux name is owned by Linus Torvalds. And I have a feeling for a use like that, Linus would probably try to get some money out of them. 
PC vendors are fearful of making Microsoft angry. They used to have to sign exclusive contracts, but this was ruled illegal long ago. So clearly that's no longer an issue then. Now they get license discounts, which means that nothing has really changed and the monopoly power continues. Do you know what is cheaper than a discount? Zero dollars. That's not the reason at all why you don't see Linux systems in like a brick and mortar computer store or even really online computer stores. You want to have products that are actually going to sell. And Linux is not the most popular operating system out there and people aren't clamoring to get their hands on a Linux system. Most people right now who are using Linux and know about Linux and want to be using Linux will go and download an ISO and install it onto a existing system. Selling a Linux system is not the way that people typically get Linux. And when we're talking about a brick and mortar store, you can't just waste that floor space for something that won't really sell when you're competing with online stores like giants such as Amazon. But as the author says, there are online vendors like Dell, for example. There's Lenovo. There are companies like System76 who their entire existence is based around Linux. But this is sort of the weird situation you're in. For the regular people who are never going to install an operating system, you need these systems. But to justify having these systems, you need people to buy them. But to justify having people to buy them, you need these systems. It is a cycle that is very hard to break. And next we have conversion costs. Organizations switching to Linux must convert custom applications and retrain technical staff and users. A potentially huge cost. I thought we were talking about general end users and not specifically business cases. This is completely separate from the Linux desktop. It's not uncommon to see a cache register running OS2. It's not uncommon to see a data entry system that's still just using DOS. Companies use the thing that works and the thing that has always worked. The only time they stop using that is if it doesn't meet the business requirements they have or it becomes way too expensive to maintain, so expensive that it would be cheaper just to get a new system. Outside of that, companies will just keep using something that's 30 years old. But that's not really relevant. Anyway, let's go to the next point. Missing applications. The main applications that most people need are available and of high quality. A web browser. Most of the browsers that most people care about are available on Linux. The only things that are missing are Google Chrome, but you can use Base Chromium and Opera GX. Even Edge is available on Linux. If you want to use, say, Brave, for example, that's on Linux. You have Firefox, you have... Actually, that's pretty much everything. Maybe Vivaldi. Vivaldi's on Linux as well. Uh, as for a mail client, you have things like Geary. You have Kmail. This is pretty much everything you need. But Thunderbird's available as well. And a lot of the other mail clients have web interfaces anyway. Document applications compatible with Microsoft Office. Mostly compatible in the case of LibreOffice. Photo editing... GIMP will do most of the things you need, and some games. I would say this is now most games, world-class modern games, are mostly missing. There are some anti-cheat games that don't work yet, but when we're talking about single-player games, yeah, you're pretty much good. When we're talking about multiplayer games that have good anti-cheat or no anti-cheat, yeah, mostly good as well. Photoshop is missing. This is very true. Photopea is available as a web interface, but this is still just a bit of a stopgap. It's not real Photoshop. But one reason for missing applications is the difficulty of development and maintenance given the balkanization issues mentioned above. As I mentioned above, um, no, it's, it's because not many people use Linux and developing for a whole new operating system is very expensive if you're not using something like Electron. Now, if you need a very specific application and a replacement isn't going to do, totally understand that Linux isn't going to have what you need in some cases. But for general day-to-day -day stuff, everything you need is here and has been here for a very long time. Now, the next one is kind of fun. 
Free software culture. Free software advocates are in denial and are not facing the problems. One often reads, having many choices is good. You can be paralyzed by choice. This is a well-established phenomenon. Or a Darwinian process will select the best alternatives. I don't know who's saying this, um, but I think that's generally true. And when we have this open development space, you're not going to be able to force people to work on specific projects. They're always going to try out new things and hopefully those different ideas make their way into the bigger projects and we get a better state overall. It doesn't happen all the time, but it certainly does happen a lot. This is also what they said in the 1990s. The freedom of Linux is also its downfall. Effective standards are lacking. I would argue that's not really the case. Linux has a lot of standards. You have things like distro packaging, the kernel development, Wayland, X11. You can argue that in some of these, like distro packaging, maybe there is too many of them. But to say the standards don't exist doesn't make any sense. We have literally XDG, which is an organization about making desktop standards, and a lot of people tend to follow them. There is no management and no roadmap. This is true but also has to be the case. You cannot have a roadmap or have management when we're talking about a decentralized system of development. And lastly, no way forward. Legacy Linux, GNU Linux, which is a weird way to frame it, will become even more irrelevant and will be abandoned by more developers. Didn't we establish at the start that uh, Linux is the biggest player in the server space? So I can't see how... Uh, that would happen, but sure. It is a shame that today's popular desktop platforms, Microsoft and Apple, have high cost, malware galore, and massive invasion of privacy. This is something I can actually agree with. Linux could have made a difference, but lack of management and standards has ruined the opportunity. As I said, there's not really any way that you can do what Linux is doing without also having this lack of management, but we do have standards, they're just not defined by this giant standards body or this giant corporation that controls everything. If you wanted Linux, there is no way that Linux could exist in the state that it's current. There is no way that Linux could exist as a thing that we know it as today without it being this open thing, without it being this open thing that anybody can get involved with. The solution would have been to consolidate Linux development resources under a unified management. Sadly, there seems to be no chance for this to happen. If that is the plan that you have, that is not even a plan. That is impossible to happen and isn't even worth thinking about. But even though we have all of this disconnected development, this doesn't mean that nothing is improving. Every day, things are getting better and better and better. Whether it's companies like Valve that are dumping a lot of money into Linux, not just into the Linux gaming side, but improving things like KDE, improving the kernel, improving hardware support, working with all these different companies like AMD, for example, and making things better. Sure, it's not going to be at the same pace as something like Windows might be doing, but things are getting better. That's absolutely true. And the goal of Linux was never to be this main PC desktop. The goal is to offer an alternative. And for many people, it pretty much already is. For others, maybe one day they'll try it out. And as it gets more attention in places like YouTube from like LTT and a bunch of others, I think more people are going to at least give it a shot and see if it's worth their time. But maybe you disagree. Maybe you think Linux is already as big as it's going to be. Maybe you think Linux is never going to grow and it's going to crash into the ground. I would love to know. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, send me pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody on Games. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.